Now it's on to the distributor. First, disconnect the coil wire from the distributor leading to the ignition coil. Then using an 8mm socket, just unscrew the two bolts, one on top and one underneath, and pull that distributor cap on out. If your cap isn't too old, you can get away with just cleaning the white buildup off the contacts inside the distributor cap, which will yield a better spark. And we all know what that means. That's right, more horsepower. Unbolt the two 14 millimeter bolts holding the distributor onto the head. Once these are removed, the distributor just pulls on out. Well, with a little wiggling. And there you go, the distributor is removed. Whoa, look at all that oil under there. Looks like we had a seriously leaky distributor. Now that we have the distributor off, let's get that vacuum pipe out of the way. Just unbolt the single bolt, disconnect the rubber hoses, and pull it out. Next up is that coolant neck. First disconnect all the electrical connectors to the neck the water temperature sensor for the gauge, and the water temperature sensor for the engine control unit. Next up, disconnect the fuel inlet hose bolt and the fuel return hose bolt. Then disconnect all those coolant lines, the water filler hose, the radiator hose, water bypass hose from the ISC valve and from the water bypass pipe, and finally the heater hose. Then disconnect those two vacuum hoses attached to the underside of the coolant neck. With all those coolant hoses, vacuum hoses, and electrical connections finally disconnected, you can unbolt the two 14 millimeter bolts holding the coolant neck assembly onto the head. Then just pull it on out. Before we can move on to the intake manifold and start working underneath the car, let's remove the cold start injector piping. Disconnect the electrical connector and then unbolt the top union bolt. Don't drop those two copper gaskets. Then unbolt the lower union bolt and again, don't forget about those two copper gaskets on there. So, we've got our engine side panels, strut tower brace, intake pipe leading up to the turbocharger from the flow meter, all that intercooler piping, that nasty looking cruise control actuator, the exhaust gas recirculation assembly, throttle body bracket, the throttle body, vacuum tube assembly, that coolant neck with all those hoses and those two vacuum hoses on the bottom, and the passenger side engine hook all removed. All right, now it's on to the intake manifold. Here's a shot of the engine out of the car so that you can easily see the two brackets or stays that you'll need to remove next. Underneath the car, you'll see that the two brackets have two bolts each, bracing the intake manifold with the engine block. Just unbolt and remove. While we're under here, check out all this cool stuff. The Toyota Variable Induction System, or TVIS, is clearly visible. Starting with the TVIS actuator, TVIS bypass valve, and the TVIS vacuum tank. The turbocharging pressure bypass valve is also visible. This is what the engine control unit uses to switch between high and low boost depending on temperature and engine knock. You can also see the knock sensor, which on this MR2 Turbo is a GM unit. Remove the TVIS and turbo bypass valve assembly by disconnecting the two electrical connectors, vacuum hose from the TVIS tank to the intake manifold, vacuum hose from the TVIS bypass valve to the TVIS actuator, and the two vacuum lines to the turbocharging pressure bypass valve. Then just unbolt the two bolts and remove the assembly. And there it is. The TVIS and turbo bypass valve assembly is removed. Disconnect the knock sensor connector, the large electrical connector to the alternator, and the oil level sensor connector. Then disconnect the ground strap attached to the intake manifold with the bolt. Now we need to remove that air tube, or as Toyota calls it, the number one air tube. It's held onto the intake manifold with two 10 millimeter bolts, one up top and one underneath. The lower bolt can be removed using a 10 millimeter socket from underneath the car. The upper bolt is hard to get to, but can be removed using a 10 millimeter wrench from up top. 
From up top, we need to disconnect the vacuum sensing line. Just use some pliers on that hose clamp and remove the rubber hose. Then unbolt the two 10 millimeter bolts holding the engine wire loom assembly onto the intake manifold. Finally, we can unbolt that intake manifold. There are four bolts and three nuts, most of which can be accessed using a socket. The two nuts on the ends of the manifold can be accessed using a wrench. Now that the intake manifold is unbolted, move it up and away from the head. Then you'll have easier access to the vacuum line on the back. Just remove that hose using some pliers. Then pull that manifold on out. Make sure that you feed all those electrical wires and connectors through the middle of the manifold. Next, just reach on down in there and remove the Toyota Variable Induction System plate. This is the Toyota Variable Induction System, or more accurately, the Tevis plate. It sits between the intake manifold and the head and contains these four valves here that are, that are either open or closed depending on engine load and engine RPM. It's actuated by this diaphragm here, which is connected via a vacuum line to the TVIS actuator. Now the idea behind this is that at low engine RPM and low load, the computer closes these valves off. Now this opens up only a single port to each combustion chamber, increasing the velocity of the air going into that combustion chamber, enhancing low end torque. Now once the engine RPM comes up and the engine load rises, the computer opens these valves up which allows more air to get into the combustion chamber to create better top-end horsepower. Pretty cool tech for 1990.